When I got hit with that knife, I got hit in the stomach right where the knife, but it knocked the breath out of me. And the guy that stabbed me cut his hand and I had all this blood over my jacket. And I kept, I was holding, oh my God, uh, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm stuck. And, and come on, let's go. And, grabbed me and because Tyrone hit him, boom, step, dropped him. And we got outside. So you have to get away from there. And we got outside the building, bam, they blew the whistle, closed the building. And now they're searching everybody in that building. Okay. Uh, I am joined on the show today by Hollywood legend and author of this book, Treo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, and Hollywood. Danny, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless you. And uh, I was, uh, where are you at? Are you in London? You're in, where are you I'm at? in Wales in the UK. Oh, okay, in Wales. Wow. Have you ever been? No, no, I've been... Uh, I've been a few places, but I've never, I'd love to go to Wales. Oh, of course, you're welcome anytime on behalf of my country. Um, so I read the book. I thought it was an absolutely phenomenal read, really enjoyed it. There were so many stories in there that are just mind blowing, to be honest. And one of the places I wanted to start is you mentioned your relationship with your uncle Gilbert and, you know, the lessons you learned from him. Um, and you said that without his lessons, you may not have survived prison at a young age. So what were those main lessons that your Uncle Gilbert taught you that helped you survive prison? Well, you know what? I mean, Gilbert taught me how to act when I went to juvenile hall. Mm. You know, don't back down. You know, the minute somebody says something wrong, just sock them. You know, just get you get you make sure you sock them first, because all you're going to do is go to the hole you know, but if you don't, then you might, something bad might happen. But if people knows you're not somebody to mess with, they leave you alone. And uh, so I started building the reputation of being somebody you don't mess with way back in juvenile hall. And, and people talk, juvenile hall, camp, youth authority, uh, prison, your reputation follows you. And and it's good to have a bad reputation <laughs> in <laughs> in prison. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, uh, it's you know you you always protect anybody that's weaker than you, and people see that because if, if you're protecting somebody, that means you're you're pretty tough. Mm. You know, you whether you are or not. If you can fake it, that yeah, I know I got, I'm protecting this kid. It's like, well, wow, then he must be a killer, you know, because so that's what we did. Like we protected a bunch of kids and and it seemed like people seemed to stay away from us. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of advice you gave at the start of the book on the power of turning fear into rage. You talked about this example of a a mother, if the child is trapped under a car, she's going to flip the car. I wonder if there's any examples that turning fear into rage helped you throughout your life. Of my whole life, well, my whole life. It's like if if people know in in especially in prison, if people know that you really believe that the bottom line to an argument is a murder, well then they don't want to argue with you. You understand, okay, and, 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 and if you believe that in your heart, then it's like, you don't argue. It's like you teachers, there is no such thing as, I'm getting mad now. There is, there is happy, sad, and rage, that's it, you know, and, and, and and you can go from happy to rage or sad to rage because there's no, I, I'm going to get mad. Because if I'm going to get mad at you, that probably means you're going to sneak up behind me and stab me in the back. So let's get this over with right away. But you got to understand, prison is the most right now place there is. There's no future. There's no past. It's like right now. You can die because somebody you didn't know 
didn't get a letter or got a letter. You know what I mean? It's, it, I mean he can just be running down the tier, see you and stab you. It's, it's like that quick. So that's where the term, I got your back. You know, when you're talking to somebody, like right now, we're talking, I got your back. So I can see what's going on behind you. You can see what's going on behind me. That's prison. Wow. This is the best part of the book for me. I love these early prison stories and how you dealt with that at such a young age. And there was one part where you mentioned, you know, you were almost under the threat of, or you thought you may be under the threat of the death penalty at one point. I can't imagine the emotions that go through someone's head at that point. How did you even begin to process that possibility when you first thought that? You know what? When 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 when, when I was sitting in the hole, I remembered a uh, a movie. I forget it. Uh, Angels, uh, Angels with Dirty Faces. I forget the name mm -hmm. of it, but but it was a east side kids it was about a gang in new york and they were like these little gangsters and they had a hero in the neighborhood there was a tough guy he was going to the chair and they were all talking about he'll spit in their eye and he'll say come and get me coppers and and then pat o'brien has to come and tell him nah he went out like a little bitch he was screaming yelling pissed his pants and i remember just asking god god if i have to die please let me go with dignity let me die with dignity don't let me you know and uh and uh i will say your name i made a proud i made a deal i'll say your name every day and i'll do whatever i can for my fellow inmate i remember saying inmate cuz i thought i was never getting out of jail and uh by the grace of God, there was a there was a DA reject. The DA rejected it. Went to Sacramento and they uh, looked at the case and threw it out because the witnesses all said, uh, "Your mother did it. I saw your dad come over and hit him with a hatchet or whatever." You know, those big stories. And the DA rejected it and said, "Let the prison take care of it." So that was. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, 1968. I started, so when I got out of the hole, I started saying God's name every day and doing whatever I can for my fellow inmate. And uh, 9, August 23rd, 1969, uh, Mad Dog Madden, the parole agent that was on the parole board said we're going to give you a chance to spread your wings trail give us back a life sentence bring us a life sentence so we don't have to deal with you anymore in other words we're kicking you out so you can bring back a life sentence so we don't have to play this game with you i fooled him i never looked back i got out august 23rd 1969 and i've never looked back i've never stopped saying god's name and i've never stopped doing whatever i can for my fellow man and inmate. Yeah, it was these stories that, that that really fascinated me. And you talk about the the right now of prison. And there's one point where you say Mike. you were 21 years old, and you know you said to yourself that you might die here and get one hour of sleep um, that night. How did you power through, and and where did you get perseverance to keep going every day? Well, you know what? It's like you have prison gives you the ability. Your, your senses get like unbelievable. Like you can be asleep and people can be running past your cell, running past your cell, running past your cell. Somebody stops, you wake up. Mm. It's just, you, you, if you're going to survive, you get in, you get in touch with the, with the vibes of, of the prison. Mm. You know, you know when something's going to go down because of the vibe. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, and that's how you survive. I got your back. It's like you're always like watching. You're always looking. You're like a, a shark. You're always, you know, you don't stand in one spot too long. You stand with your back against the wall. There's all these things that you, that you, uh, you kind of, they're instincts, you know. And it's amazing. I'll never forget that one to where, People are running back and forth in front of yourself. But the minute somebody stopped, 
Hey, what do you want? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. And then they'll take off, you know, because they understand you. And uh, that's how you survive, knowing, hey, you better stay awake. Yeah, I love how so open and, and vulnerable you are about all the topics in the book. I mean, you, you're very open about, you know, drug addiction. And you, you say at one point that heroin was my escape hatch. Yeah. What was it your escape from? Everything. Everything. I had an angry dad. I had a mom who had secrets. I had a, you know... A habit, the heroin habit. You know, once you know, it's so funny. It's like you heroin is an escape, but the only problem is that you can escape from everything else but heroin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a, I don't know how to say. How do you let go of a tiger? You know, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> you know, you let go. I'll eat you. Yeah. So, and uh, the only way I ever kicked heroin was in jail. Yeah. Wow. Was that through just not having access to it? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Just, just kicking cold. Do you wonder where you could have ended up if it wasn't, you know, for jail and not being able to access it? If you had access to it all the time, do you worry that you never would have kicked it? I'd been dead. Wow. I'd been dead. That's simple. It's like it was my uncle, my uncle, my hero, my mentor. He died of an overdose of drugs, and he had, I think, thirteen thousand dollars in his pocket and drugs, and he had died of an overdose. You know, so he had everything. And, and uh, the only way you can beat heroin is not use it, is not get near it. And it's funny. I was talking at a school, and uh, and. Uh, this one kid, a little smart ass. I said, you know, I've never seen a successful drug addict. He said, well, what about Chapo? You know, Chapo was there. What about him? Well, you know, he beat it. You tell him he's buried. Do you understand? They have to pump him sunlight. He will never see the sun again. I'd rather be dead. And then, you know, somebody, oh, uh, uh, Pablo, yeah, yeah, okay. They blew him apart. So it's like, I don't get all the money, all the money, all the fame, all the whatever. All you end up with is a habit, a bullet, and a cell to kick it in. That's it. That's what you end up with. When you were, uh, when you were younger, you, you talk about how you were sent to these um, camps to, instead of serving your, your sentence, you were set to do meaningful work. You fought fires and you- no, Those were, those were, those were institutions. Those were camps for juveniles. They yeah. used to have them. They don't have them. They, you would go, they would send, you'd go to camp and you would fight forest fires, but that was your sentence. Yeah. You yeah. Understand? I thought that was the smartest thing in the world, except for the intellectual Mexicans got together and said, well, that's, that's cruel and unused, but no, it isn't teaching suckers how to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, literally a lot of the guys that went to those camps ended up in forestry. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Working in the forestry. And one of the reasons why America, we're having so many big fires now is because our job was to clean those fire breaks. Our job was to make sure we cut out the fuel, you know, you said that it sort of gave you your first sense of self-esteem. Well, how did it do that for you? What, what was it? Was it the meaningful work behind it? You know Let me tell you, you know, when you're, we would be driving in a truck with big fire going, right? And some lady would come out, please, please, my backyard. And, and it was so cool to jump out of that truck and like, row build a big fire break around her house. I loved it when she would come up with a cup of coffee and go, here, here you want some coffee? And then she'd wink. Like, yeah, whoa, whiskey, you know what I mean? It had whiskey, a little, a little, uh, 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 a little shot of whiskey. So, but, you know, the, the people loved us. It's like, wow, you're saving somebody's house. We were working on the Sacramento River once when it was overflowing. And, and it was raining, right? And we're at two, three o'clock in the morning, and we're sandbagging, putting sandbags. And these little old ladies, they come up in there with their, uh, their uh, 
you know, rain gear and stuff. Here, here's some hot coffee, some hot coffee. And they give you that wink, you know. And it's, and I think, Grandma, go, go on, go on. I got it. Whoa, God, the whiskey will warm you up so good. And, uh, but, but it was just like you, you were a hero to them. They didn't know you were in prison. They didn't know you were in jail. They just knew you were trying to save their houses. And that, that was like, wow, I'm a, I'm a hero. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a light going on. Here. Hero, hero, hero. You know? Well, we li- in the world we live in today, I think that a lot of kids or, or, you know, young adults anyway, they're all in a rush to try and get rich and famous and achieve all this success. But would you encourage the youth to seek out meaningful work at a young age, to really learn what it is, to really learn those lessons? Yeah, yeah, you, that's a good point. You know, it's so funny. It's like because I, I, I've worked. I mean, I've thrown, I've thrown a shovel full of dirt at an eighty-foot flame. You know, the giant redwood tree on fire, and I'm throwing a shovel full of dirt at it. I know what spitting and and a, and, a, and a dirt comes out. You know, and you blow your nose as little rocks. You know, and I, I know what that is. You know, and work. So when I'm on a movie set and, and everybody's complaining about too hot <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're tired and I was working hard. I, she had, hey, try, try throwing a shovel at an 80 foot flame, you know? And yeah. It's funny because uh, a point we were, oh, I was doing a film in, in Miami, Florida and whew, it was so hot that the girls had to, would do a scene cut and have to change a blouse because it was soaking wet. There was just so much humidity, right? And I'd I'd do a scene, I'd take off my shirt and I wouldn't put it on till the next scene because yeah, I didn't want to get so and uh, I wouldn't complain. I just everybody was it's too hot. We ought to, you know, you ought to break us we'll do this later. And the director was looking at me and he goes, okay, Trey, what's your beef? You know what I mean? <laughs> You're like you want to, and I, I pointed at some guys on a roof, you know, da, 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 working on a roof. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, they didn't have somebody bringing an umbrella. You know what I mean? They didn't have somebody holding an umbrella over them, you know, or, or letting them change shirts. You know, the guys were like soaking wet or no shirt, you know. And, and uh, I said, I've done that. And he goes, God, I wish I had five more like you. you know? <laughs> and, and I understood because I've worked. You know what I mean? I've worked. We did a movie. We did a scene in the desert, a movie in the desert. And everybody was like whining and complaining. And then there was like almost a riot on the set. And uh, and <laughs> I had a blanket on the floor. And I, had, I had sunscreen on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had a, what do you call it? Suntan oil. I was laying down. I just got sunscreen on my face because you can't, you know, you can't uh, get too tanned. Yeah. You know, so I just said, what are you doing? I said, shit. <laughs> We're in a desert. Might as well get some sun. Everybody else <laughs> crying and whining. Wow. So in a way, you've got these two worlds. You've got, you know, a Hollywood actor with, you know, comes with all this notoriety, this glamour, this glitz. You've got, you know, prison life. They're like two opposite ends of the scale, but it's almost like that life helped you in this life. Absolutely. I think that life was a character study in the characters I was going to play. And you know what, really, I'm still pretty tied to prison. My uh, my assistant, Mario Castillo, we work for uh, the lifers program. So we've got like five or six lifers, the guys that have gotten out of prison after doing life, like, 35 years, 30 years, 29 years. And we're, you know, finding them jobs and trying to get them situated. They have nobody. You know, you do 35 years in prison, your family's gone. You know what I mean? Your, your, your kids don't even know you, you know? So, so we try to like, just get them back with their families, get them. And Mario's doing a hell of a job. So, so we're still pretty tied, tied, tied into prisons. Amazing. Yeah, and it's those, it is those prison stories in the book that I really sort of gravitated to and enjoyed the most. There's so many great stories in there. Um, there's one where you mentioned that you used a, a magazine 
mm-hmm. um, under your clothes to, to prevent yourself from getting stabbed. And then, you know, not too long after that guy was, was dead on the floor and you were, you know, in, in another, you were removed from that state, but you were laughing and joking with a, with a friend. Does prison sort of create a, that a thick skin, like nothing else in the world can, because to go from that to that emotion, that seems. Hey, it, you know what? You have to make everything funny or humorous because prison will drive you crazy. Prison will drive you crazy. It'll drive you. You have to kind of go become somewhat of a psychopath by yourself, you know, somewhat of a not caring. And and and, and it was funny because when I got hit with that knife, I got hit in the stomach right where the knife, but it knocked the breath out of me. And the guy that stabbed me cut his hand and I had all this blood over my jacket. And I kept... I was holding, oh my God, uh, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, uh, I'm stuck. And, and come on, let's go. And grab me, and because Tyrone hit him, boom, boom, stabbed him, dropped him. And we got outside, so you have to get away from there. And we got outside the building, bam, they blew the whistle, closed the building. And now they're searching everybody in that building. And my, I took off, I didn't have no blood on me. And Tyrone started teasing me. Ooh, they got me, they got me. And like a little girl, I was, shut up, punk. Well, we started laughing, right? Because I knew it. I mean, it's like, I thought I got stabbed, but I got the wind knocked out of me is what it was. Yeah, is these stories, and there's so many stories like this in the book, and this is why I encourage people to, to go out and buy the book and read these for themselves in, in great detail. I mean, you know, there's one part in the book where you talk about meeting Charles Manson in prison, and you said that, he could have been a, a pro hypnotist. Like yeah. th- these stories are unbelievable. What do you remember from that encounter? He was, you know, Charles Manson couldn't have done what he did anywhere else. Like you pick a neighborhood in London, hmm. a, a bad neighborhood. He couldn't have gone to a bad neighborhood in London and got girls to do what he did. They'd have pimped him out. I mean, and, and I have no disrespect to Charlie, but he was like five foot five or something. And he wasn't like a thug, you know what I mean? And the girls he got, they were all broken. My friend, George Perry was up in Frisco in, in Oakland when that was going on. Hate Ashbury and hippie shit and all that, right? And, uh, and, and he said, these girls, they were all being used by the pimps and, and, and thugs in, in hate Ashbury and, and, uh, free love, but they were, they were making money off. So Charlie came to these, got these broken girls that were looking for a daddy and, and he had plenty of acid. So, you know, so, so he had good game, game, you know, not, you know, but when, when we saw him in, in, uh, in, uh, on TV, on those special talking about, yeah, and, and we killing stuff. We thought it was funny. We're like, are you kidding? I slapped this little bitch, you know? And and so would some most of the guys that we were in jail with. Because, because you gotta understand the toughest guy in prison is the guy with the most knives. If I've got five or six guys with knives, you're dead. And I'm not going to fight you. I mean, Mike Tyson, I talked to Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson says, shit, nobody care how tough you are in prison. I'm the toughest guy in the world. Four inches of steel will take care of me. You know, I mean, he knows it. We all, so, and that is the right now. So we got no bullies in prison. You know what I mean? Scariest thing in prison is a, Short Mexican in tennis shoes with a big knife because he can stab you and run fast. Wow. And and it's funny because people say, well, that's a cowardly act. No, it's a winning act. That's prison. So when you left prison, did you suffer any identity issues? What were the feelings? Were you thinking... Who am I now? What do I do next? Because up to this point, I've been Danny Trejo, the criminal. Let me tell you something funny you asked, okay? Because when I got I got out of prison on a Saturday, I went to an AA meeting Saturday night. I stayed out till about four o'clock in the morning. And, and when I got home, I laid my mom at my mom's house. And then, 
And then about 12 o'clock, I was standing out in front of the, no, about 3.30, I was standing out in front of my mom's house and I'm looking around in this neighborhood. Understand, I have robbed every house in this neighborhood. I've broken into every garage. I've stolen something, right? You know. And Monday was trash day. And I just taken out my mom's trash cans. Because they were, then, this is 1969. All you had was a big tub. It was before recycling and all that. You just put everything in a tub and pull it out, right? And I see this lady struggling to get her, her tub out, right? So I walk over to her. Her exact words were, no me robas, daddy. Don't rob me, daddy. And I said, shut up, vieja. I went and I grabbed her trash can. I pulled it out. I walked to the, her backyard to get her other trash can. I could see it. And she never took her eyes off me because she knew I was going to break for that garage and steal her lawnmower, steal something I could sell. And I didn't. I grabbed her trash can and I pulled it out and I walked away. And I pulled it out, and then I just walked away. When I was walking away, I was thinking, okay, that's all I can do to make my amends. I don't know how to say, you know, I'm sorry for robbing your house, you know, or, or beating up your kids or whatever. You know. and, uh, and I started taking out the old people's trash cans in my mom's neighborhood. And that's all I could do. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to be a nice guy. Before going to, before I did that, before I made that deal with God, if you were on fire, I wouldn't piss on you. Unless you owed me money. You, you know, you know what I mean? I'd be saying, I wasn't a nice, and I had to learn how to be this nice guy. I, hi there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So when you left, prison you there's that transit we talked earlier about the the worlds between you know the hollywood and the prison life how did you even make that transition and what did people say because you were danny Trejo, the tough guy and now you're mixing with hollywood you know what i i didn't i i was out 17 years before i got into hollywood you know i, I got out in 1969 i was a gardener for a while i was a, a well first i was worked in a wrecking yard then i was a gardener and then i, I had a gardening business then i was a drug counselor i was a drug counselor for about 16 17 years and mm -hmm. then uh helping one of the guys that i was helping i got into hollywood he got me in as an ex, extra and uh i walked onto a movie set of a movie called Runaway Train. I ran into Eddie Bunker. And Eddie Bunker was a guy that I knew in prison. And uh, he asked me if I was still boxing. I said, nah, I'm training. Yeah, and he said, we need somebody to train one of the actors out of box. Now, as an extra, they give you $50 cash. You know. And did I tell you this story already? No. And uh, they give you $50 cash and uh, don't tell the IRS, okay, but but uh, it was cash money. So <laughs> shit, so. And if you worked overtime, you got like 80 bucks for one night, you know, so. And uh, Eddie said, Danny, are you still boxing? I go, no, I'm not boxing. I train. He said, we need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. And I said, what's it pay? And he said, 320 a day. And I said, how bad do you want this guy beat up? I, th I thought, no, I thought he wanted me to beat somebody. I wasn't making 320 a week, you know? And so I, he goes, no, 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 no. The actor's really high strung, Danny. You can't hit him. He might sock you. I said, Eddie, for 320 bucks, give him a stick. Are you crazy? I've been beat up for free. I started training an actor named Eric Roberts how to box for the movie Runaway Train. And the director, Andre Kajalowski, this Russian, saw that I could handle Eric. So, because Eric was a movie star and they're hard to handle. And, uh, and the guy they had cast to fight Eric in this movie was another pretty boy. So it was like, two per cause Eric is prettier than his sister. All right. So they, so, you know, they battle the two pretty boys, you know, it didn't look right. And, and, uh, and then Eric wanted to wear these tight shorts. And <laughs> Eric, you don't wear tight shorts in prison. No, no, but these are... You know. So anyway, he wore the tight shorts. And, and, uh, and so then 
Andre saw that this didn't look right. And uh, Eddie told him, it looks like two bitches fighting. What are you talking about, man? And so Andre talked about contrast. Conte, he was Russian aristocrat. Contrast. He went to Eric. Ooh. Then he went to uh, the guy that they had casket. Ooh. And then he goes to me, he goes, hey, contrast. You know? So I was contrast. So, so uh, Eric chose me to fight him in the, in the movie. And then uh, Andre says, Danny, you fight Eric in movie and you be my friend. Now, if you have a prison background, you don't like people saying, you be my friend. And because what does that mean? I got a shower with you, bitch? You, you, I mean, it's like, this is a, almost a, a pickup line. You know what I mean? And so, and then he leans over and he kisses me on both cheeks and walks away, right? I looked at Eddie, I said, Eddie, I'm gonna train that kid for 320 a day, but if I'm gonna be kissing that old man, I want more money. And he goes, no, no, they're European. I didn't know, I didn't know Europeans kissed, you know, so, but when I found out what Andre Kozlowski did for me, giving me a SAG card, <clears throat> I'd have kissed him in the mouth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and we became awesome friends. He's a, he, you know, but he didn't understand because he says, we, he was, we were, I was over at his house. Me and Eddie were over at his house and he was making us borscht, borscht, tomato soup, I think, but anyway, okay. boss. And, uh, and uh, he was saying, you know, I don't understand American actors. I don't understand. Fuck you, Asadara, and go to their trailer. We don't stand that in Russia. And I thought, I know, you should have sucked on Russia. I mean, it was like, you know, but, but, you know, we are, we have movie stars and, Movie stars do that shit. That's like I won't be called a movie star. No, no, I'm an actor. I'm just an actor, man. I'm not. I'm not uh, entitled to anything but a free meal. Mm. I love that. And there's one quote about your acting career that you you say in the book. You say that my film career is simply a vessel that helps me amplify a message to a wider audience. Right what right What is your message? My my platform. I go to schools, I go to juvenile halls, I go to prisons, and I say, you know what? Drugs and alcohol will absolutely ruin your life. Education is the key to anything you want to do, anything. And I got to tell you this. They listen because they know I've sat in those chairs, you know, so, and I've been to some of the toughest schools in LA, in Los Angeles, in California, and, you know, and, uh, Teachers have tried to get the auditorium to be quiet and they, you know, they're, ah, and then I just walk on stage and it goes quiet. And it's like, not because of Danny Trejo, but because of the guy from Heat, Desperado, Spy Kids, Blood In, Blood Out. They want to hear what that guy has to say. So God's given me that platform. That's what acting does. I'd love to, to finish on one quote I've got here written down of yours you say that everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping somebody else everything everything can everything. you give us some examples on that I helped up I helped Mario Castillo hmm. and he saved my son's life my secretary Mary Matickle saved my daughter's life Everything good that is happening. I I did a low budget movie that for a favor, and it ended up a trilogy. And I ended up meeting a producer named Ash Shaw, who saw that I like good food. I don't eat processed food. I won't eat fast food. He said, "Danny, why don't you open a restaurant?" And. Uh, he brought me a business plan. I've got seven restaurants right now. And if I wouldn't have done that favor or listened to my agent, Gloria and Hosa, I wouldn't be in, a, in the restaurant business right now. I helped a lady with her daughter who wanted to be a, a singer. So I started a record label and I got a, 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 look at this, wait, hold on. Danny Trails. 
Chicano Soul Shop. That's our wow. first album. I'm getting ready to drop another one. I'm dropping a single with uh, right now. It's called If You Don't Mind. It's with Trish Toledo and uh, Coda the Barber. And it's going to be dropped today or tomorrow. Either today or tomorrow. And, th and then I'm getting ready to drop an another album with, with Trejo Music, Jasmine Torres, Tara New, Diana Gonzalez, and... Uh, uh, Trish Toledo, Baby Bash, who is awesome, and and uh, Frankie J, and I'm gonna drop this other album, and we're like kicking ass. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. So all these things came from helping people. Um, Every, everything. Everything. Um, nothing. Nothing. You know what? I don't know. People that get stuff just don't appreciate it unless you work for it you know okay. let's do something for it and that's me i guess i've been turned into a, a johnny do-gooder and i love it <laughs> well all the lessons messages we talked about today are all detailed in this book your new book tell everyone where they can get it why you wrote it let them know where they can find it God bless you. Yeah, I just, you know what? You can find it. Where can you find available it? Everywhere. It's available everywhere right now. All good bookstores. Amazon. It, yeah, Amazon. I wrote it just because I wanted people to know that, especially women, it's, you know, it wasn't your fault. You know, women have a built-in, it was my fault. You know what? Some of you pick broken men. I was broken. You know, the women that tried to fix me, they blame themselves. At that time, I was unfixable. Now I am. <laughs> so if you want <laughs> Well, Danny, thank you so much for writing the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone thank will. And thank you so much for this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope the rest of your day and your media duties go well. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you, man. God bless you too. I'll